today's episode, we have Adam Rimmer of Flood Flash. Now, Flood Flash have been a guest I've been looking to have on the show for some time because they are an exemplary example of how parametric insurance and technology can look to identify real world problems. Flood Flash have created a highly innovative, fast execution insurance product dealing with the yawning gap for businesses affected by flooding. And in today's episode, we're going to be able to explore exactly how Adam and his co-founder went from concept to first product, how they've grown that product in the UK during, let's face it, pretty difficult times, and how that success has translated into the growth they're experiencing now and the $15 million in funding they've secured to expand into the US. Adam will share some of the dynamics of running a business with a co-founder. He'll also explore the values that they've identified, which they believe will help them identify and secure the best talent moving forward. It's an interview that's full of things that I didn't know about, and I hope will help inform you about the potentiality of parametric insurance. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. And without further ado, I give you Adam Rimmer of Flood Flash. Hi, Adam. Welcome to the Talent Equal Show. Thanks for being here. Hey, well, absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. All right. Well, Adam, you've been someone I wanted to get on the show for a while because I think what you're doing with Flood Flash is really exciting, really interesting. It marries up cool technology, new but old areas of insurance, and also serving a community purpose. But before I sort of dive into why I'm so excited about it, I'm excited, interested about Flood Flash, why don't you tell us what Flood Flash is and how a solution it works and how it came about? Yeah, absolutely. So at Flood Flash, we are trying to help more people recover from catastrophe using something called parametric insurance. Now, parametric insurance is a sort of shift of paradigm of how to think about the whole insurance model, where Traditionally, you know, when a claim happens, you would work out the cost of damage and then the insurer would, you know, would kind of make you whole, as it were, or reimburse you for the cost of that damage. Now that works in a lot of arenas, but with some arenas, particularly in natural catastrophe insurance, where the losses are so, so, so large, so difficult to quantify, doing it on that traditional basis adds so much cost and uncertainty that it means that in the highest risk areas, people can't get cover. In People would have experienced this if they, particularly if they, you know, run a business that's next to a river or on a fault line, their sort of flood or quake cover becomes incredibly expensive very quickly. Now, parametric insurance, the payout is based not on the cost of damage, but it's based on a predefined parameter. And that might be depth of water in a flood. It might be earthquake magnitude in an earthquake. It might be wind speed in a hurricane. But all we say is that if that threshold is exceeded, then the payment is made. And actually, the best proxy is life insurance, right? So, you know, as you said, it's kind of blends together some of the oldest bits and the newest bits of the insurance world. You know, life insurance is arguably the oldest type of insurance out there, where we've all agreed that, you know, when you die, no loss adjuster comes around to work out how much your death costs or like, you know, which bits of your death were pre-existing damage or anything like this. You know, we've just agreed it's much easier that upfront we're going to say, if a parameter is met, are you, are you dead? <laughs> then, 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 uh, then uh, you know, then a payment is made, and this just works in the same way. Yeah. So if the parameter is met, then a payment is made, and it means that that payment can happen incredibly quickly. So when Storm Christoph hit the UK about this time last year, we settled a full catastrophic flood claim that would typically take months, from water in the building to cash in the bank in nine hours and forty-four minutes. Incredible. You know, that's not just a vanity metric. It means that that business is more likely to survive. There's a stat from FEMA in the US that says that. 90% of small businesses that don't reopen their doors within a week of a catastrophe will close their doors permanently within a year. So that cash flow, that speed, as well as just the availability of that insurance and us being able to provide it, it means that we can cover those in the highest risk areas around the world for the first time. All right, cool. So we've geeked out a bit on parametric insurance, but I, I think it's a really important term, frankly, because it, it solves so many issues. For those who listen to the show, know my thoughts around parametric insurance, because it solves this indemnity component of insurance, which is about loss adjusting, sending loss adjusters around, working out the price of the actual like suffered loss by defining the payout linked to a certain trigger. And there can be level, like multiple triggers that can be associated with a parametric product. For those out there interested in entomology, power is a Latin word, which I think origin is uh, means defense, protection against. 
a parameter, as we most will know, is a is a measurement of metric, and metric is the same. So it seems to be a blending of those two, like parametric as a terminology. So you can sort of work out just from sort of the entomology what it kind of means. But specifically, parametric insurance is exciting, I think, because it has its applications in the blockchain, because there is no need to have a deep and complex claims department. So you can have automatic triggers, which could be managed by a smart contract or managed by a sensor or managed by an oracle, a data oracle. There's lots of ways it can be managed. And Flood Flash to tackle this by, and if I remember, Adam, just when I saw you sorting with your sound before the show began, behind you, I think there's one of the tubes. Maybe I'm not wrong yeah. in terms of the sensors. Um, so this obviously is great for radio, <laughs> but there's effectively a white tube. Do you want to describe what that is and the technology that yeah. you guys came up with? Exactly. So this is our claims department. Every Flood Flash client has one of these installed on the external wall of their building. And for those out there who obviously maybe listen to this on a pod, it's effectively maybe a one inch diameter, two inch diameter white tube, it looks like, which is what, two meters long? Is that right? Yeah, it's about, yeah, it's about five foot. Five foot. Okay. Yeah. So um, five foot um, for our, our metric friends, that's probably about 1.75 one meters. So 160 something. 160 like meters. There we go. Yeah. Good. <laughs> sorry. Continue. Sorry. <laughs> so this is our claims department. And one of these sits on the external wall of every single one of our clients' properties. It sits there 99% of the time doing nothing until it detects flood water. When that happens, it springs into action, starts sending us the data of the flood depth back here at Flood Flash HQ. And that's when we determine whether the flood depth has been reached, i.e. the parameter has been met, and then we can send the payment straight away. It's got its own self-contained power and comms. The battery in one of these will last for about 10 years, which is wow. pretty useful because clearly we don't want to be relying on kind of mains power or Wi-Fi in the event of a flood. And the reason this is so important is actually to combat one of the things that has always dogged parametric insurance, which is this idea of basis risk. Now, basis risk is a bit of jargon that, that refers to the difference between the payout you get and the cost of your damage. Now, because with a parametric policy, you have set the payout up front, they will never be perfectly aligned, your, your, the payout and your damage. The idea is to get them about right. And, you know, and in a catastrophe, that's what you need, right? It isn't about perfect pound for pound or dollar for dollar indemnification. It is about the right amount of cash to get that business or that household back up and running again as, as, as fast as possible. Now, one of the reasons that basis risk can creep into a parametric policy is that the parameter you're using doesn't correlate highly enough with loss. For example, you know, I wouldn't use earthquake magnitude as a trigger for a parametric flood policy, to use an extreme example, because the magnitude of the earthquake has absolutely zero correlation with what I experience in a flood. Now, even for a parametric flood policy, there are different options and things that you could use. So you could say, right, we're going to use rainfall data in the local area, because that's a bit correlated with flood. You know, we could use that gauge on the river that's two miles away, or that gauge on the coast that's five miles away. But all of these, too much basis risk creeps in because you're not measuring the flood depth right at the point of the insured party. Because it means that actually the like, rainfall, for example, that actually causes a flood at the site, the exact region where that rainfall hits the ground will then dictate where that flood happens. And just like just a very small fall movement in that rainfall means the rainfall runoff accumulates somewhere else. The flood happens in a different place. You know, if you're using a river gauge or a tidal gauge, then they, you know, if they're sort of, you know, two miles away, five, five miles away, then it's very difficult to really understand what level of that gauge correlates with, with the level of your property. So am I right in understanding that, Adam, that dependent on the level that's read by the tube, like that correlates to the actual payout that they receive, or is it a, a flat rate that the customer receives? So uh, the customer can actually choose that themselves. And typically they will choose that you know, based on the structure of their building or the type of business that they have. So for example, they might say, right, when water gets to uh, 20 centimetres, it's going to ingress my building and I'm going to need £20,000 to relay the carpets and clean up. When it gets to 40 centimetres, like it's going to hit my electrical circuits and I'm going to need another £40,000 to repair those. When it gets to 60 centimetres, that's when it hits my machinery and I'm going to need another £300,000 to replace that because that's the value of my machinery on the books. Fantastic. That's really clever. So you can have those graduated payouts or you can indeed have a single payout. And for some types of businesses, that makes sense, you know, and that kind of, there is that beauty in the, in the ability of the client and their, their broker and agent, you know, it is typically, typically bought through brokers and agents. 
you know, that allows the payout to correlate as tightly as possible with the client's loss and therefore reduce that basis risk that we talked about. This talks about, this for me sits with this idea of being able to tailor the need of your insurance, but also for those out there who maybe live in a, a dry place <laughs> or, or where they're in an elevated and they don't have flood risk, they also must realize that often if you live in a flood area that getting insurance is a problem in and of itself, isn't it? Just getting any coverage for your business or your home for that matter is imp near to impossible. So I suppose at the end of the day, you guys can say, you know, you may be a house that lives within a slightly elevated region within a flood region and have a lower chance of risk, or you may have installed flood defenses where you feel pretty confident that they'll be robust enough to stand up against an adverse weather condition. And so your guys are saying, well, we're cool. Here's the measurement. Here's what happens. We're happy with that risk. And, and everybody's sort of in, a, in the know. It's a tailored micro type of insurance, I suppose. That's right. So we are pricing algorithm sets a price on a building by building basis. So your premium is not set by your postcode or, you know, or some kind of generic interpretation of the risk. It is, uh, it is a specific price for, for your location. And it is businesses and landlords at the moment in the UK. Um, that's partly because a scheme called Flood Re exists in the UK, um, which is sort of government mandated schemes that basically means on all of our home insurance, we pay a levy which goes to effectively subsidize cover for homeowners in high risk areas. But businesses aren't eligible for that scheme, right? If you're a business operating in that area, in those type of areas, you know, if the insurers are turning away from you and excluding flood damage, you typically have nowhere else to turn. But that is the purpose of the product. And I think we'll talk about the origin story later. Um, but we've seen this idea of parametric insurance solve this problem before, this idea of being able to cover previously uninsurable risks. Yeah, super cool. So hopefully we're listening is going, okay, I get it. I get the method. Let's talk a bit about the origin because I'm, I'm interested. Like, where did this happen? Where did the claims in a tube idea come from? And how did you guys <laughs> put that stuff together? So Ian and I met in 2011 at a, a firm called RMS, who are the world's largest risk modeling firm, bought by Moody's last year publicly. And it was there that Ian and I worked on their capital markets team. So we were sort of structuring and modeling triggers on a type of very large insurance contract called an insurance linked security or a catastrophe bond. Well, they used to be called catastrophe bonds more often, but then, you know, I think people didn't like investing in things with catastrophe in the title. So, uh, so, so we, we were instructed yeah. to start calling them insurance linked securities. <laughs> um, but essentially, they are ways of allowing big pools of capital, so like pension funds, hedge funds, to effectively provide insurance and reinsurance against catastrophes and earn a return on, on providing that insurance. And typically, you know, and they make a huge amount of sense because it removes the risk of these catastrophes outside of the relatively small pool of insurance firms into the much wider capital markets. You know, for example, when Hurricane Andrew hit Florida in 1992, before catastrophe bonds and insurance thing securities were in play, as it were, a hurricane hits, they realize that, you know, everybody's kind of reinsured each other, how all the money kind of moves around, but no new money enters the system. And a significant portion of the Florida insurance industry went bust as a result of that. So they realized to make the world more resilient, we needed to spread this risk. That's how these these sort of catastrophe bonds, insurance thing securities came about. And our job at RMS was to effectively say for one of these contracts that might effectively default if a sort of hurricane of a certain size or an earthquake of a certain size happens, we had to say, what was the probability of that happening, which is effectively setting the price. And a lot of them operate like traditional reinsurance contracts. So, um, you know, it's, it's about the total cost of the loss being added up. So you kind of often don't know for a few years after the event whether or not that default has occurred. But some of them have these parametric triggers. And this is kind of where Ian and I first saw this idea of parametric insurance in action. And the one in particular, actually, that was really the one that inspired what we're doing today is one that we worked on, or, or, or Ian worked on specifically for the Metropolitan Transit Authority in New York, who run the subway system. Now, when Sandy hit the US in 2012, hit the East Coast, there were about $20 billion or so of damage in that event. And a big chunk of that was the subway. You know, you'll remember all the shots in the news of the subway tunnels flooded. And the subway expected to be able to renew their insurance at the end of the year. But surprise, surprise, when it came to the end of the year, the insurer said, no way, right? We are not, we, we are not touching that again. So they had to solve this and they did that by issuing one of these parametric catastrophe bonds. And the contract that Ian designed 
said that if water levels at a tide gauge at the tip of Manhattan gets to um, eight and a half feet, i.e. if something like Hurricane Sandy happens again, then the subway will get paid $200 million to start making their repairs. So we looked at that and we said, kind of, that's amazing. They've used this idea of parametric insurance to go from being uninsurable, the traditional market not being able to cover them, to now being covered. And we said, well, the New York subway are not the only people with this problem. You know, every single year, $58 billion of damage goes uninsured. Um, you know, all around the world, almost every single country on the planet has a flood under insurance problem. And so we said, can we take this idea and turn it into a mass market product? Because those catastrophe bonds, you know, you need sort of several million dollars on kind of investment bankers and lawyers. You need these pre-existing tide gauges to be able to issue those. So ultimately, all we're doing at Flood Flash is taking that same concept and turning that into a product that can help more people recover from catastrophe. So this actually makes me think about the technology. So you had the concept from a contractual point of view, sitting in London somewhere, thinking about this sort of a contractual point of view with some pre-existing technologies or markers or data oracles, we might call them. And then you decided to leverage the internet of things, which is effectively what this tube is. So yeah, exactly. I'm interested about that. Like, you know, you're both like insurers. You're not like, uh, hopefully <laughs> made, there is a great heritage of British men with sheds creating things. <laughs> So I'm really interested like how you came up with actually creating the technology that measures this, that claim in the tube. So um, Ian's background was particularly helpful here. Um, so Ian, you know, before RMS, Ian did a PhD, um, where he actually spent a lot of like time on the Greenland ice sheets, like measuring flows around there um, and measuring how they melted. And with that, he did a lot of water level measuring and using sensors. So that gave us a grounding, um, or at least an understanding of what we wanted to do. And we knew that we needed to develop a sensor because things like satellite data or existing gauge data wouldn't allow us to provide this cover to enough people with low enough basis risk. So the sensor was a must and still is. So this originally started, it was really, you know, Ian and I talking about it on the sort of, we used to get the Northern Line at home um, on the London Tube together, sort of talking about it on there. And then, you know, one day it was like, well, well, shall I come around to yours on Sunday and we'll talk about if this is a natural goer? And then, so I did, and we got a list of about sort of three questions as to kind of, you know, whether or not is this doable? Um, is there some reason that this this can't be done? So we then have a sort of period of, you know, sneaking off from our old job, going for coffees with people, working out, you know, if this wasn't possible. And we, we, we couldn't find any reason that it wouldn't be or nothing that we, that we didn't feel we couldn't solve. And so and it was at that point that we got our first offer of um, sort of pre-seed investment, um, £200,000 investment from the InsureTech Gateway, you know, who, you know, who, we, who we still work with, with closely today. And that, allowed us to leave our jobs, pay ourselves a basic salary, get a pilot scheme going, get insurance capital to come and sit behind it. We went through the FCA regulatory sandbox to demonstrate that, that you know, the regulators were happy with this you know, new and strange type of insurance. The key kind of proof points we did with that first bit of investment was to work with a um, technology company based outside Cambridge called TTP to demonstrate that it was going to be possible to develop a sensor at the level of cost that makes um, the unit economics of this business work. A TTP, so a TTP are a sensor construction company, is that correct? Yeah, well, not just sensors. Um, they work on all sorts of different technologies, um, but they're a product development company. Okay, so let me summarize that for the listeners. So if I recall, so what you've done is you are both like um, working with RMS, well-known in, in the space, on ILS. Um, this is sort of the idea of taking and, and diverting what well, slicing up reinsurance risks and selling them to the capital markets, which is a multi-trillion market. And, and then those, those are bought by hedge funds and other asset managers. Within that, you saw a, a form of uninsurable risk, which was this to do with the Manhattan, with Storm Sand, Manhattan Underground, which then led to that conceptualization of, could we do something similar and provide that in the UK initially, as I understand. That led to you having the sort of the entrepreneur's exploration and dilemma. Do we go? Do we not? Figuring it out. And then Taking the leap, which is hard, <laughs> but you had a friend with you, somebody you could trust. And then InsureTech Gateway, who are um, an incubator in the space, offered up um, seed capital, you know, bringing the idea. And then there was some exploration about getting the technology right, working with some technology providers, TTP. And here you are today. So what was the first test case for you? Because, you know, England is known for its rain, particularly England. <laughs> so was, it, was that what you did? You chose a flood area, went to sort of do a micro test on, on the provision. How did you get from zero to one? Yeah, we got very popular in Carlisle very quickly, funnily enough. <laughs> so, you know, the thing with catastrophe insurance, interestingly, is that 
unlike auto insurance, home insurance, where you're going to have like a pretty reasonably steady trickle of claims throughout the year. The nature of catastrophe insurance is such that, you know, you have nothing, 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 and then the catastrophe hits, and then you have all your claims on the same day. And you need partners who understand that on the insurance capital side as well. And I think that's one of the reasons why we really enjoy working with the reinsurers, because for reinsurers, that's their bread and butter, catastrophe risk. You know, they understand that that's the pattern of losses, you know. So it does mean that we kind of, we never knew when we were going to get our first actual proof point. And the first phase of the business was going around to insurance brokers and agents around the country saying, you know, explaining the product and how it worked. And they would say, guys, this, this makes so much sense. Like, you know, how has this not been done before? It's such a good idea. Have you ever actually paid anybody? To which, we, to which we, you know, would have to say, well, no, but I promise we will. I really do. <laughs> and then the day that happened was, was, was February 8th, 2020, <laughs> Ian's birthday, in fact. It was a Sunday, and it was when Storm Chiara hit, the week before Storm Dennis, the, 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 the hit straight after. And so, yeah, Sunday morning, Ian called me up and said, right, we've got one. And we're having these messages coming in from the sensors. I think it was about eight or ten claims that happened all together in that storm. And, you know, obviously the storm, an incredibly destructive event for those businesses affected, but for the proof of, for parametric insurance generally, it was amazing. That was the day when parametric insurance stopped being this kind of interesting thing to talk about at conferences and became something that had saved businesses and saved livelihoods. The testimonials we've got after paying those businesses so fast, getting them back up and running, you know, a lot of them had been through a claim, flood claim process before, right? These are people in high risk areas you know, which had taken kind of months and just so much stress and toll on the business. But these are like often small business owners, entrepreneurs, they just want to get going. They want to, they, you know, they want, they want capital in the bank and they, they want to solve that problem themselves. You know, we had one of them swearing on his child's life that taking out a flood flash policy was the best thing he'd done for five years. And like, I cannot think of any product testimonial that sounds like that for any product, let alone an insurance product, right? People don't talk about insurance in those terms. And so we were so proud of the whole team that day. I think most people know this intuitively listening to this entrepreneurs doing this who may be interested in fintech or insurtech as a place to go and think about doing something. They may not have had a claim before, but in insurance particularly, that moment of claim is such a visceral experience, particularly when it's expensive, particularly when it's really impacting your life. And having that process smoothed out and triggered automatically and then giving people agency to get on with make, like finding the solution, putting cash in the bank, Go ahead, figure it out. You know, do you want to do a pivot with your business now that you've been flooded out? Okay, do a pivot, right? You want to right. fix that, that unit? Fix it. You know, you want to buy some new stock? That's like just you go and get the provider, the, the contractor. Maybe you can do some of it yourself, right? It's such a, an empowering moment, right? Get the money in the bank. Let people make choices. I, I think as an entrepreneur myself, I'm like, yes, I'd want to do that. I want that, you know, instead of having a, a six-month indemnity process, claims management, all the bloody stuff that goes on with it. It's an absolute nightmare. <laughs> um, I had a flood as well in my house, and I remember it. It was just... Really? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, my, my son flooded the upstairs toilet and uh, <laughs> flooded the downstairs <laughs> of the house. Children, they cost you money. Um, but I remember that process. It was, it was very drawn out. So, great. So you've sort of, you've tested it. You've had, a, you've had a flood. You've served your customers. So you've got this concept and, and it's working. Like, when was, do you want to just like go back and like bring us to where you are now? Because I think that's also a really interesting point, like where you were then, you've tested, you've proven it to like where you've got to like now in 2022. Tell us about some of the things you've done recently. So that storm was February 2020. Brilliant pieces of PR off the back of that. Ian and I were meant to be on BBC Breakfast talking about it, except um, we then got cut because they wanted to talk uh, about a new virus that was going around Wuhan at the time. <laughs> um, so, so, you know. I won't claim that we're the biggest uh, c casualties of COVID, but you know that would, oh, yeah. that would have been a great bit of PR. Um, but since then, it's been fantastic because then we had the story, right? It was no longer hypothetical. It was this has saved businesses and saved livelihoods. And being able to, you know, show those testimonials or play them, you know, we, they're all on, on video. You, know, you can see them on our website to new brokers, new agents who are trying to solve this flood problem for their clients. Then the things start taking off. You know, through that growth in the UK, then through the storm Christoph um, in early 2021, further proof points, you know, expanding out through more, more brokers, more agents. It's been a phenomenal success story in the UK, but almost every country in the world has a flood under insurance problem. So, you know, now it is about taking that internationally. We've been building up the team here. 
you know, we are you know adding people on analytics on product on software engineering on on sales on marketing on, on compliance on hardware you know it's it's a business with many different facets right you know because we have hardware things for example you know we have extra departments that a traditional like insurer or mga isn't going to have so yeah growing out that team continuously improving the you know the the, the software which is two parts of that one is the the portal that brokers and agents um log on to instantly generate quotes for parametric cover for their clients the second is the pricing algorithm you know which is the smart bit that actually sets the prices on a building by building basis the constant improvement on those you know and then using the data that's come back in from the sensors as well um you know which to me is one of the such exciting bits about this business because you know we're there we have a data set that actually nobody else has access to you know which means we can constantly improve the algorithm get more policies out there get more data improve the algorithm and you end up with that with that like wonderful uh, virtuous circle mm. why do you need an improvement in the algorithm is the algorithm specifically measuring potential catastrophe in an area beyond what sent you're picking up from the sensor i'm interested in that like yeah just maybe you could explain a bit to me about so if you are insuring against something that happens sort of regularly and often in the grand scheme of things like car crashes you don't really need we don't you don't really need a kind of computer model to uh, help you price those things you need statistics and that's what actuarial statistics will do will help you work out from the universe of past cases that you have seen what's the probability of a driver with a given set of characteristics having a crash and therefore what you should charge them now with catastrophes the problem is that like in the grand scheme of things they're rare and that means your sample size from history just isn't big enough to use those same statistics you know like you know if we've got 50 years of flood history how do we know what a one in 200 year one in 500 year flood looks like it's more complex than just looking at the historical data and that is why companies like rms exist in fact um to is to help answer that question it is to say like what is the probability of these bad things happening now one of the things that we always used to say at, at rms and i suspect is a you know is a trope of cat modelers everywhere is to say that you know all models are wrong some models are useful you know these models are intended to be a representation of reality but they are just computer models they cannot be perfect and that isn't just for catastrophe models you know that's everything from like you know the computer models that are used by betting companies to set odds for sporting events for example you know they're trying to model reality but they are not reality every model has its own errors in you know i take fantasy football far too seriously for example and have like recently learned python to automate the selection of my team and there's a great website called 538.com um that i'm sure a lot of a lot of your listeners will know uh run by Nate Silver um you know who became particularly famous as a, as a political statistician but they do a lot of things on sports now as well on their site they have a you know it's a bit on their their premier league model and it's worth a read because you know they they explain very clearly kind of how the model works but also like you know the areas where they have had to improve it because the model isn't reality and therefore they make adjustments make changes and in much the same way we have a model and it and it works right it allows us to set prices with sufficient confidence that we can get people like Munich Re to allow us to set prices on you know on their their behalf it's Munich Re who provide the actual capital behind the or who underwrite the insurance products but with that new data coming in, we can always improve it. And so that pricing algorithm will, will never be finished. We will always be adding to it and always improving it. Mm. So this algorithm is a, is a way for you to perfect the um, upfront um, price that you'd be charging based on an area for the for the insurance. It makes a lot of sense. And then yeah, so the algorithm is the underwriting department and the sensor is the claims department. That's kind of the, mm. that's the best way to think about it. Cool, very cool. So I think at this moment, like um, the talent equal show isn't just about finding cool companies are doing and helping communities, which you clearly are. Uh, it's like, I love hearing that Flood Flash is actually solving a real world problem for businesses, small and big, in terms of making sure they can keep the lights on should a catastrophe hit. And you're dealing with something that has been driven by climate change um, and will be increasingly affected by climate change. So that type of resilience in the system is very, very important. But now I'd like to just talk about another part of what Talent Equal Podcast is about, which is about understanding what it's like being an entrepreneur, growing a business, and finding people and leading talent, because none of this is possible without building a team. And as you kind of said, you were two guys working in a big corporate before, and now you've come to set your own shop up and it's growing and it's expanding. So I'd like just to talk to us a bit about that lesson that you've learned, like the good and the bad, like 
what have you learned that's really surprised you about how difficult or how easy it is to grow a business? Can you just tell us a bit about, you know, creating Flood Flash and, and where you're going now? You know, I've always had a sort of entrepreneurial itch, you know, for, for, for as long as I can remember, really, and always imagined that I would try and do something like this, you know, and I had always kind of imagined that, oh, that would be something I'd be good at. And then it's only then doing it, you just realize how bad you actually are. Uh, and just how just all the holes in your own skill set and your own knowledge and because you're kind of almost by definition you're doing a job that you've never done before but also a job that nobody's done before right nobody has tried to build this company selling um you know selling this type of product and we're sort of very much flying without a map so both for the company and personally you know i've learned so much about team building about leadership through the hard times as well right you know covid uh, that kind of first crunch of COVID, you know, when, you know, we had to ask like the whole team to take pay cuts, uh, you know, we had to put a quarter of the team on furlough because we just didn't know what was going to happen at that point. And that was so stressful, you know, and I, you know, ended up in tears like at least twice during that period because I just I really acutely felt it. But, you know, we, but we then got through it like with that team that we pulled we pulled together right you know without us without a single redundancy through the whole through through the whole period and then came out flying the other side you know it was it was really because of the whole you know the whole team pulling together you know which i think is is partly due to that that culture that we've been able to build you know so i hear that in covid has been an incredibly difficult time for all startup businesses all actually established businesses for that matter many many businesses anyway how did having a co-founder help you through that and having somebody you can rely on and talk us a bit through that sort of dynamic of working with a co-founder. Yeah, I couldn't have imagined doing it without without Ian. Um, I mean, I couldn't imagine doing any of this without Ian. But, you know, that bit in particular is where that's the other person that is experiencing the closest thing to what you are. You know, family and friends and partners will be so helpful and supportive, but none of them actually are going through exactly the same thing that that, that you are. And having a co-founder who does in those crunch periods is vital. Just having a sounding board to understand that somebody's feeling the same things that, 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 that you are feeling. You know, it was was great. And I think, you know, Ian and I have sort of worked together for, you know, for more than 10 years now. We've always worked very well together, but I think we actually came out of that, you know, even better partners. That's an interesting lesson for people to learn about the importance of selecting your co-founders right. And sometimes it can be by accident, almost, but you get to know someone in pre that phase. But I've, you know, for a long time as, you know, someone who does talent selection for a, for a living, I've really thought, you know, hard about the dynamics between co-founders and how to get that right. And early on, you know, finding co-founders who really fit with you and work with you well isn't always about competencies. It can really be about the values that they share, right? 100%. It's something I know you and I have, you know, kind of touched on in previously, you know, off air, but, you know, talking about the values and the culture that you're starting to define, because you and Ian will ultimately define that. And that's, it's a lot about you. And now that you're growing and talk about what's coming next for you in, in terms of expansion into the US and growing the team there where you're not going to be with everybody all the time, Right. How have you come to think about values and defining values and culture and what that means for you as a business? So we decided that now is the time to do it. Values are things that a lot of startups will talk about and take seriously. <laughs> things a lot of corporates will talk about and maybe don't take as seriously. But we thought this is the right time in Fun Flash's journey to do it. If we had done it when it was just the two of us, although the values will ultimately come from us, when it's just the two of you, you don't really know what the shape of the team is going to be. You, know, you don't really know what are, the, what are they going to be the important things that are going to make a individual successful at Flood Flash and to make Flood Flash successful as a company. But if we to do this too late, you know, in let's say a year's time, we just say, well, we've just done all this hiring and we've missed the opportunity to put this kind of filter on our hires to hire people who are going to be successful at Flood Flash and make Flood Flash successful as a result. So the first phase of this was you know, basically a day, Ian and I spending a day in his garden, just, you know, shooting the breeze on this stuff and talking about it conceptually, but also talking about it in terms of like specific examples that we had seen from ourselves, from the team. This is something that worked really well. This is something that didn't work really well. These are the things that we need to try and capture and, 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 and distill in these, in, these, in these values. And so we, we have now distilled those into four values that work really well for us. Um, you know, they come from, from us. 
that importance of having a founder that shares your values kind of, you know, you of course saw that happen there, right? You know, Ian and I, you know, agree, there was kind of no disagreement or arguing as to what should be in them. It was just more, you know, about how to, how to define them, but they are now like embodied by the team. Um, and, you know, we're not perfect at them, right? And, you know, I think if we had values that we were all, you know, perfect at embodying, then there wouldn't really be much point in having them. Yeah. There's still, um, you know, room for us to develop, but I think they are our strengths as a team. Can you share the values with us? Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the first one is own the outcome, which is super important in any startup. You know, you cannot rely too much on being told what to do. You need to make sure you're aligned, of course, but you need to grasp and solve problems yourself and your colleagues need to be able to rely on you to do that. So own the outcome. The second one is use evidence. Like we're a pretty quantity team given our background. But using evidence is just the right thing to do for any decision. We don't want to be making things on gut because guts can be wrong. We want to be making them on as much evidence as we can. Ideally, that means quant evidence. It doesn't always, right? There are, in the real world, there are so many decisions you have to make where quantitative evidence just isn't available. But you should be going on something and you should be able to articulate to other members of the team why you think what you think. So use evidence. The third one is be helpful. Again, in a company for our size and stage, it doesn't work if people are too rigidly focused on their job description, what they have to do. People need to pitch in, help out. On different days, people can be doing different things. You know, we still want people to have their own goals. People do have their own goals and focus on those, right? On any day, you know, some curveball might happen. Um, and we've got to help each other out to, to do that, to get there, help each other to learn and help each other to grow and ultimately to make Flood Flash more successful. So be helpful is the third one. And the fourth one, which is my favorite, is be brave. And I think this is so important. I mentioned earlier this idea of like flying without a map, you know, both personally and as a, as, a, as a company, and that feels so true so often. Like we don't have the answers, but be brave is about realizing that that's fine. Just because we don't have the answers doesn't mean we can't come up with them. Doing something that nobody else has done before is fascinating and it is fun. You know, it it can be stressful, but it is fun, and you know, and you have to be brave embrace that for this to work the be brave is number four mm, very nice i mean my own experience of working with values and i'm i'm a one for banging the values drum i'm a value-based headhunter which i think is a new term i'm trying to define i think that i would say to you in hearing those one amazing that you've defined some because even at this young age of your organization two years to have those values is great and I think, you know, frankly, values are a journey. You may find in two years' time that you want to add to them, you want to change one of them slightly that really encapsulates what you've experienced and felt. Did you see the, uh, the famous, the, the change of Meta's values yesterday? I didn't, no. I didn't see this. Um, a good friend of mine works for one of the Meta divisions and he used to, you know, he used to always go on about their, their old values and they've just, they've just changed them up. Um, but one of them, that I think it's been, you know, not too controversial of me to say has been a um, been been subject to a bit of ridicule is is this idea of meta mates me, um, which is I think is a is a take on like shipmates me of sort of an old kind of na- um, you know naval and nautical <laughs> thing, but you know this this concept of meta mates I think has uh, not undeservedly been uh, you know been subject to a bit of stick. Yeah, well I think this is it though, like. You know, one, they've really got to be felt, like they've got to be truthfully felt. And, you know, for me, I look out for humility, integrity, assertiveness, resilience. But I think one that's for me is becoming, you know, increasingly important, which I think maybe all of these sit in is kindness. And I think like every action we take, you know, if you own the outcome, use evidence, helpful and brave, if that's all sat within an atmosphere of being kind to each other, then, you know, kindness is like just this universal quality, which can pick up all of the values and and really set the tone for them and the way that they're delivered. And I'm continually playing with the right mix and the thinking about those things and how many do you add, how many do you not? But in a beyond it, then it's the integrity of actually living the values, which can really challenge an organization. And they should be, I mean, this is the thing, values shouldn't just be about, you know, holding hands and singing Kumbaya. They should also at times be about saying, did you live up to those? And that can be quite difficult for people at times and, and rightly so. But so I also wonder though, listening to you, it's really cool because you've got two quanti people who uh, maybe are more on the thinking side of 
the psychological spectrum. And so sometimes talking about these more feelingsy type things can be a little bit difficult, right? Uh, I don't know. I mean, am I miles out there? How have you experienced this, Adam? Like this sort of getting more into the softer side of these things? Yeah, no, I think, you, you know, you are correct and also correct that these values are also about, they're not just about suitability, i.e., us to be able to filter candidates and, and candidates to filter us to see if Flood Flash is a company that they would want to work for. But they're also about accountability, i.e., can we hold each other around the table and around the company accountable to those values, both on a kind of, you know, regular sort of quarterly review cycle or, you know, just day to day? And it can be hard and difficult having those conversations. You know, I talked earlier about the things that I'm having to learn in the CEO seat. And one of them is having difficult conversations. That is something that, you know, I have struggled with in the past. And I have found that writing the things down before I say them like helps. But it is important to hold each other accountable. And you know, ultimately that makes the business and all of us more successful as a result. Yeah, totally. And I'm interested to see your journey with them and hear and check back in with you on these values. And you know, I think um, the fact that you sat down and find them and, and you know, live by them, that's fantastic. So I, I think that sort of brings me to like wanting to ask you a bit about like um, the future of Flow Flash. We talked about the values and the culture of the organization and why this is important. As I mentioned, you guys are about to expand into the US and you've just secured uh, $15 million of funding to help with that expansion. So congratulations. Thank you. So, I mean, I may have just spoiled the story there, <laughs> but <laughs> tell, tell the audience like um, <laughs> exactly what you're going to do with all of this money and uh, with the expansion, what, what's about to happen. Thank you. It is, uh, yeah, exciting times. So yeah, $15 million Series A, led by um, Boyan Ventures, um, by Amy Francetic at Boyan Ventures, who will join our board. She's based in Chicago and is a climate-focused investor. So it really covers that part of the business really well. Also putting a big check in our Munich Reventures, who understand the insurance side of what we're doing really well. So the syndicate that we have been able to put together is perfectly aligned. We then have other investors in Germany and Japan, which are the priority markets. Um, that syndicate that we put together is perfectly aligned to the growth that we see for this business. But the US is next. I mentioned earlier that almost every country in the world has a flood under insurance problem, but nowhere is that bigger than the US. Hurricane storm surge is a big part of that. Clearly uh, not something we have to deal with, particularly in the UK. When you look at you know, Harvey 2017, Sandy 2012, Katrina 2005, Ida last year, the damage from these events is enormous. And you know, just on an annual basis, you have about $20 billion of uninsured flood damage in the US alone every year. So even with you know um, efforts like the National Flood Insurance Program in the US, that still leaves you know particularly businesses inadequately covered. You know the maximum cover you can get under the National Flood Insurance Program in the states is half a million dollars, um, which for most businesses is not enough. It doesn't cover any form of business interruption, i.e., if you have to stop trading because of a flood, which of course you do have to stop trading because of a flood, right? That is very difficult to quantify in a traditional policy. You have you typically will end up spending more on like forensic accountants working out the size of the claim than you will on the actual claim itself. But with parametric cover, that goes away. It solves that problem beautifully. So that and that's that size of the market is why the US is next for us. So it's then, yeah, growing the team out there and launching later this year, both our kind of our mass market product and also moving into into bigger businesses and bigger policies as well. Brilliant. Is serving the private owner of property on the horizon for Flood Flash or is it always going to be a B2B? So it's very much a um, market question rather than a technology question. So the algorithm and the sensor, we could turn those to homeowners tomorrow. Because flood is such a big problem, it is one that politicians turn to their heads to. And that is why Flood Re that I mentioned earlier exists in the UK to subsidise flood cover for homeowners in the, in, in the UK. The National Flood Insurance Programme is a broadly equivalent programme in the US. Um, for some homeowners, it works very well. And for others, it doesn't. And so whilst there is a solution for some of that market, you know, yes, you're absolutely right that, you know, when the right time comes, we'll be turning the same technology to help homeowners there as well. Fantastic. I'll be interested to see how, you know, smart contracts and the blockchain tends to help this uh, part of the market as well. I think um, one of the early godfathers of Bitcoin, a guy called Nick Zabo, um, who many will know, who are interested in crypto, he actually pointed in back in 2017 to particularly parametric insurance having high levels of suitability for the smart contracts which are executed on the blockchain. I wonder what you think about that. Yeah. So full disclosure, we don't do that at the moment, right? It is not yet necessary for what we're doing. But certainly, you know, a couple of years ago, maybe longer, we were seeing 
people try and kind of shoehorn like distributed ledger technology into into all sorts of use cases, some of which it was appropriate for and some of which it wasn't. Parametric insurance is something it can be useful for. Right. You know, so like I mean, ultimately I see a world where all these catastrophe claims are being picked up by sensors and settled immediately on smart contracts without any human interaction whatsoever. So that is further down the roadmap for us, right? Like at the moment, it's about proving this market, proving that the product itself works for people. Because ultimately for the end customer, it's not as important for them as long as they trust the where the money's coming from, which they typically do with insurance, right? You know, that's not a new concept that an insurer will be paying for you then the end customer doesn't doesn't really you know care on what kind of technology that process is based for us as we become more efficient and grow then yeah that is an area that that technology will be useful well i'm a big crypto uh, advocate and in, in very much appreciate the technologies and i can certainly see a future where you know smart contracts are you know are already you know can be put into an nft and the nfts like then become representative of a type of risk at the moment that risk is currently in a paper based form of the smart contract those contract forms those formulated in contracts, which are then traded in the form of ILSs into the capital markets. But there's certainly a future where all of this will be encompassed in maybe an NFT, which has all of the smart contracts and parameters written within it. It's secured upon the blockchain and the types of data that it's seeking could be powered by the sorts of tools that Flood Flash have, but they can be freely exchanged and um, traded you know, in the same way that these contracts are on the capital markets. That's my vision and I'm sure it will happen. Right now, like you say, there's probably not quite needed right yet, but there is a future where crypto eats finance and the capital markets transactions increasingly. And right. It's an exciting time for the world of risk transfer. Yes, exactly. So it's great. I mean, you're already there. So as a business, there's potentiality uh, linking into these technologies, but at the moment, focus on solving the solution for your customers, right? So, well, I'm going to wish you all the success in that. And as we sort of wind the show to an end now, I always like to ask these questions specifically just like, things that have influenced you that can help other like entrepreneurs or other people understand a bit about you or help them on their own journey. And usually for me, that's around types of books that you've read or thinkers that have influenced you. So love it if you could share three books that have really influenced you or, or thinkers or any other type of person you might be helpful for listeners on their own journey. Yeah, of course. So uh, my wife recently gave birth to our first uh, children plural. Oh, congratulations. Um, which has been uh, relentless, but fun. And there is nothing in the world that is more full of old wives' tales and general bullshit than pregnancy and early years care, right? And so that, you know, we talked earlier about that, you know, the flood flash values and how they come from us, like the idea of using evidence is incredibly important to me. And I wanted to make sure that with my wife being kind of like bombarded with information from all sides that she was getting the correct information. There's a fantastic book called Expecting Better by a lady called Emily Oster, who's a behavioral economist at the University of Chicago, who was so frustrated by the same thing that she was like, right, I'm going to sit down and I'm not just going to review the evidence, but I'm going to review the quality of the evidence of anything from like, you know, how much you can drink when pregnant, what you can eat, et cetera, et cetera. And we both, my wife and I, found it so helpful having a trusted source going through that you know, amazing thing for the first time. And she's now released uh, another one called Crib Sheet about early years care, which you know has like really kind of dismantles a lot of the a lot of the talk about you know breastfeeding, for example, where again you just get hit with so much information and you know really typically from like the shoutiest person on Facebook. So yeah, expecting better by Emily Oster. Uh, for anybody who is, you know, thinking about or going through that pretty big life change. What else? Uh, Red Notice by Bill Browder, uh, his sort of autobiographical story of, you know, effectively becoming the kind of first investor in post-communist Russia. Amazing story, like, you know, true story, but just, um, you know, yeah, <laughs> reads like some sort of rip-roaring spy novel. Well, I couldn't put it down. Like, like one of the other things I've really noticed doing this job is that, you know, I actually read more like fiction books now than I did before. You know, in my old job, actually, I would still be kind of craving some of that intellectual stimulation and I would be, I would be reading a lot more kind of nonfiction books in, in the evening. But now, not just books, actually, you know, TV as well. Like I just kind of, you know, your brain is so full from the day, from all the, you know, making decisions and switching from tasks that I kind of just really appreciating some kind of, you know, like often, you know, lower brow material. So like, I would just nothing better than just like vegging out in front of Game of Thrones or something in the evening just <laughs> to, uh, just to sort of, um, chill out, right. And to take your brain away. So I started reading, um, 
I started reading Dune by Frank Herbert uh, recently, obviously, you know, with a film coming out, which uh, which I thought was awesome. So I thought I'd read the book as well. And then in and I, we actually flew to Chicago last week. Uh, we got to the airport and we found that we had both brought a copy of Dune to read on the plane. Fantastic. Um, which, so yeah, you know, we probably just couldn't have looked at two nerdier people uh, sitting wow. there reading yeah. our copies of Dune, probably only not watching Dune because it wasn't available on the flight. Well, that's that's fantastic. Well, I mean, Adam, I'm, uh, those who may listen as well who know this, I am a huge fan of Dune. Um, it's one of the only books I reread every year on a regular basis. And so um, it's, uh, yeah, and I've even got my own, started my own collection of originals from like first editions and, and uh, oh, amazing. from the 80s, being a complete Fantastic. nerd now. So, um, <laughs> do, I, I, well, it, but in, within it, it's a fascinating story for those listening, but also you, you score a really important point. There is a type of brain rest that comes with, but also I think actually type of brain expansion that comes with fiction mm. because particularly sci-fi as well, it helps you think about, you know, future outcomes. Usually they're underwriting like types of human like experiences, like like universal human experiences, but then layering on projections of what that could mean in the future. And and I think also some creativity comes from that rest. And and I know I do retreat into uh, fiction and particularly June uh, when I'm feeling like I need that rest from, you know, this, the, the general um, thinking of life and um, it's, a, it's a great one so I can always recommend it so, uh, it was Thomas Weddle Weddlesborg who was on our show he said it was uh, his secular bible in fact so um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great read glad we're all on the same page yeah well I can definitely recommend the audiobook for listeners and yourself um, the audiobook is produced fantastically the original well the, the first book anyway the, the latter version is not so much but um, certainly the first one so great. And I, I think the second book you said was, was Red Disc, right? Did I hear that correctly? Red Notice. Red Notice. Red Good, Notice. thank you. So yeah. that one also sounded extremely interesting and expecting better. Well, I'm, I'm three kids in, so we're sort of, and our youngest is six. So um, <laughs> we've probably made all those horrendous mistakes already, uh, hussing out them. But <laughs> you have twins, which is incredible. So I can absolutely understand that you're looking to get some guidance. But underpinning all of that is good data, right? And uh, having the right, right information. So, well... Adam, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you very much for spending the time to talk us today um, on Talent Equals Podcast and you know, tell us about the journey for Flood Flash and where you're going next. And, you know, I would say thank you. Keep up the good work. You know, what you're doing is really important for society, um, which is awesome. And uh, yeah, again, thank you very much. My absolute pleasure. Thanks, Will. 